Cisco Modeling Labs 2.1 is just about upon us. The general availability release should be out sometime uh, uh, next month, September of 2020. And what I want to do is give you an early preview, a, a walkthrough of the new features, what to expect uh, when compared to CML 2.0. And this will be for both the uh, Enterprise and, and the Personal Edition. And where there's variation, I'll mention that. The first thing you notice when you connect to a CML 2.1 server um, is they've zhuzhed up the login screen. You now have this uh, image pane over here and then the login uh, screen or the login uh, pane is to the left as opposed to taking up the whole screen for the login. Uh, they've also, and you see it here uh, initially with some of these UI elements with the login button, when you log in, you see it a lot more. They've changed the UI frame, uh, framework that drives CML. So previously, it was using a bootstrap-based framework, and in 2.1, they've switched over to using Vuetify. A lot of back-end and, and modern things uh, and, and, and considerations went into that, but one of the besides some of the, the, the changes to the buttons and other various widgets that you'll notice is they've made it a lot lighter. They've the, the CSS artifacts, the HTML and JavaScript, they've pared that down a little bit so that quote unquote download experience of pulling these pages down uh, is a lot better. Uh, there's a lot less overhead there. Um, the other thing they've done in the initial lab dashboard you see here is they've maxim maximized the real estate so that the tiles and the, the functional part of the screen um, takes up most of the space. But the system health that you're used to seeing in 2.0, it's still there. And in fact, it's ever present on all of the screens, but it's down here at the bottom and it's minimized. If you click on it though, you get the full details of the CPU, memory, disk, and other various uh, virtualized virtualization stats about the labs running, and you can click back on that to re-minimize it. So this is the lab manager, or lab, I should say lab dashboard view, the tile. This is what you see by default. And you may notice that in some of these silhouette thumbprints, there's little bit of text shown through here. So they've enhanced the silhouette uh, thumbprint a little bit uh, in 2.1. Uh, but I want to call your attention to this list view. Now there was a list view in 2.0. I don't know if anyone used it, but in 2.1, you're going to start, at least for the enterprise edition, you're going to start seeing um, the multi-user, more multi-user capabilities uh, come into play here. So when I click the show list view, I, I still get the silhouette thumbprint. I get a, a list of all the labs, seeing those that are running and those that aren't. But you also notice up here, there's this new show all slider. By default, you're only going to see labs that you own or you created, even if you're an administrator and I'm logged in as admin. However, if as an administrator, I click show all, I will see labs that are created by myself admin, as well as any other user on the system. And this is new to 2.1. So administrators in 2.1 will have the ability to see and even interact with labs owned by a different user. And this lab happens to be owned by my alter ego, Jay Clark, who, who a different account in the uh, in this particular CML instance. So going back to the uh, lab dashboard, here again is our tile view. Some other things to uh, look at before we, we dig any further. Um, we have this uh, user um, uh, tile or user button up at the top, admin. We'll talk about dark mode in a second, uh, but it's been easier now to change your password as a user. So if you go to the, the user button up at the top right and you click settings, here's where you can change the current user password. You can always go back there. Now you also notice that there's this dark mode uh, checkbox and there's a dark mode checkbox um, well, there was, this is the latest EFT, um, but dark mode is a new thing that's coming to 2.1. It, however, is not persistent at the moment, meaning that if I'm logged in, I selected dark mode, and then I do uh, a shift reload, it's there, but if I come back to um, uh, CML in a different session, different browser, it doesn't persist those changes yet. So dark mode, you might have to turn on every time you come back to CML. Um, and they might notice some other things. Some uh, widgets aren't yet 
dark modified, if I can invent a word there. Uh, but in general, the, the latest EFT, and this is post EFT3, um, but the latest EFT uh, has a lot of enhancements, a lot of fixes, specifically around dark mode. So for those of you who thought, wow, the white screen and white background and everything was like burning your retinas, dark mode can be a, a nice helpful way of, of better navigating CML. So back to the default, just so we can see everything clearly. I'm going to go into my running lab here and look at some uh, additional enhancements. We see that, again, some of the things, subtle things are, are different in 2.1 uh, because of the new Viewtify framework. So this becomes a, a blue uh, tab there instead of the green tab. Um, the other thing you notice is, again, this is persistent. The system health is persistent and minimized, but we can maximize it. And this toolbar, lab going back to the lab manager, accessing the other tools, turning on and off dark mode and accessing your settings, that is also ever present on all of these screens, whereas it, it didn't exist in 2.0. So those are some of the niceties around the UI, but there are other cooler, uh, or I should say maybe equally as cool enhancements within the functionality of CML. So this is a running lab. And if I click on a link, let's say I click on this link between my VLAN 20 external connectivity and my router 2, you see I can get link info, simulate. I'll come back to the simulate tab in a second because there's some new stuff there as well. And packet capture. The packet capture feature has been greatly enhanced in 2.1. Um, tremendously enhanced, as a matter of fact, um, to support rich packet decoding in the UI, as well as the ability to download um, PCAP files right off of the server. So I'm going to go ahead and start a packet capture. Um, I can, however, apply a uh, Berkeley packet filter, so I can apply filtering ahead of time, as well as doing things like max packet, packet time. Um, but I'm just going to... Um, I'm just going to start a general packet capture. It says waiting for packets. So we already see some STP, some spanning tree protocol, but I'm going to generate some IPv6 pings. This is a, an IPv6 only link. So I'm going to ping out to my IPv6 default gateway. Okay, and then I'll click back on the link, back on the link into packet capture and I'll stop and I'll scroll down to where I start to uh, uh, do my uh, ICMP v6. If I click on one of the packets over here, I can see all of the details. So I can see the ethernet, um, I can see the, I, uh, in this case, ICMP v6 or IPv6 and ICMP v6 um, data there, all decoded. This is uh, similar to what you might see in something like Wireshark or T-Shark, the, the command line version. Um, so you can look at that without having to download the packet capture if you don't want. So all within the browser, all with the richness that a tool like Wireshark would show you. But if you want, you can click the download button and that will download a PCAP file that you can open in Wireshark. I'm not going to launch Wireshark, but Trust me, it is, it is a, a fully functional um, PCAP file. So that is the packet capture. And as you saw, I clicked on the link, started it, clicked away, came back. The state of that packet capture is still running and persistent. And it's all based on the settings for how long it's going to run or how many packets it's going to capture. And this is also a cool troubleshooting tool because if you're not seeing um, packets hit your destination. If you can see them in the packet capture, that means they're hitting the, the back-end fabric that drives the interconnections in Cisco modeling labs. So packet capture is a great new, the enhanced packet capture, great new feature to CML 2.1. The other per link feature that was added in 2.1 can be found under the simulate tab. And this is a latecomer to the game. We weren't going to see any UI enhancements here, but uh, uh, Ralph, one of the engineers, snuck them in at the last minute. And that is the ability to drive link conditioning without the need of the WAN emulator. So in, in CML 2.0, in order to add latency, loss, jitter, to a link, you needed to add this WAN emulator node and adjust things there. Uh, what was added, however, was a way of driving this using the CML REST API, as well as using it uh, with the Python client library. Um, 
and that was going to be what we had in 2.1, but as I mentioned, Ralph uh, felt a little saucy one night, and he um, added the UI hooks for that as well. So if you click on a link and then click on the Simulate tab, you can specify the bandwidth of the link, uh, the link latency, link jitter loss, uh, and you don't have to do all of these. You can say, I only want like 256K uh, with an additional 50 milliseconds of latency, um, no additional jitter, no additional loss, and apply. And now I can come back over to um, my link. And you saw the last time I pinged uh, was a min of one millisecond, average of one millisecond, max of four milliseconds. If I do the same ping again, I get a lot more, uh, a lot more latency because I've applied that uh, 50 millisecond additional latency. And we see that in the round trip response time as well. So those are the, the link uh, um, enhancements that were made in, in CML 2.1. One of the problems we were seeing with uh, CML 2.0 is with starting a, a lot of nodes on a, a server, and, and particularly a server that didn't have a lot of uh, vCPUs allocated to it. So you might have, might have seen an error where it said the nodes were queued, and they were going to be queued until there was more uh, CPU resources available. But you might have also noticed that the, the overall CPU usage was fairly low. And the reason was that CML 2.0 was looking at the one minute load average and doing a calculation based on that, based on the number of CPUs the system had. So typically when you got that error, the, the, really the only way around it was to put in two or, or more additional vCPUs in order to get all the nodes to boot. Uh, in 2.1, the, the node starting algorithm has been completely uh, re-engineered, and it's based on total number of CPUs, and uh, each CPU is given 100 points. And every time you, you start a node, depending on how many CPUs that node has, it's going to require um, if it has one CPU, it's going to require 100 points. If it has two, it's going to require 200 points. And that's the default. However, when you're adding a new node, say I'm going to add an iOS V node to this topology, and I'll connect it over here to my branch router. I can come to the Simulate tab, scroll down here, and you can see that there's a CPU limit. And by default, it says 100%. But if I say, you know what, I only want 50% of the CPU to be allocated, give it the default of 512 uh, meg of memory, I only want 50% of CPU to be allocated. This means that instead of requiring 100 points for this node to start, it will only require only require 50 points. Um, and I can go down to as low as 20% per node. And I can do this either at a, a per node basis, I can do it at a per image basis, and I can do it at a per node definition basis. And I'll show you those other settings as well. Obviously, if I drop this down, the node is going to take longer to boot up, but at least you'll be able to start the entire topology, maybe up to, depends on, relatively how many CPUs you do have, but let's say 12, 14, 16 nodes um, without having to add additional vCPUs or virtual CPUs to the CML VM. And so you can do it here at the node uh, level, and you have to do it uh, before the node boots, obviously, before the node boots for the first time. But you can also do it here in the node and image definition. Um, pages. So if you're creating a new node definition, so a, a new device type, you could specify the default CPU limit that the node gets. By default, this is 100%. However many CPUs it has, it'll use 100%. But you could set the default to be something lower, like 75 or 50 if you want. You can also do it at the image definition. So the image definition is a, a version of the operating system that the node will run. So I can come over here to, for example, this uh, iOS V 1563M, and here I can also set the CPU limit. Um, and again, 100, 100 is the maximum, 20% is the uh, lower bound limit. And this will allow a more optimized start of all of your nodes, so you can get those larger topologies running without having to add because maybe you don't have the extra vCPUs, you wouldn't have to add those additional vCPUs to the server. 
So those are the major um, uh, UI enhancements uh, and, and uh, graphical functionality that you will see in uh, 2.1. Uh, obviously, because everything in CML is done in, at an API first uh, basis, everything has an API behind it. Uh, I encourage you to check out the, uh, the Swagger interface for 2.1, the open API interface, to look at all of the additional capabilities that were there. For example, that link conditioning we looked at, there are APIs for that. So you can drive that, that link conditioning programmatically if you're doing some CI CD workflows, some other type of automation, and you want to make sure that you're getting the the true user experience if you're doing a remote branch and you have to add more latency or some loss jitter to those links, you can do that uh, all programmatically without the need for that WAN emulator node. Um, the other thing uh, that is that was uh, recently added is a licensing, a set of licensing, um, uh, enhanced licensing APIs that translate over to the um, Python client library. So while we had licensing APIs in 2.0, we didn't have them um, connected in the Python client library. So you would have to go through and um, manipulate the uh, license uh, REST API endpoints directly. Um, there was a 2.0.1 release as well that added support for specific license uh, reservation or SLR um, with APIs added for that. And 2.1, of course, brings in the SLR uh, feature as well if you need that for kind of uh, air gap smart licensing deployments. And speaking of the Python client library, so we can click on client library here and see all of the documentation. Uh, if you're playing with the EFT currently, we don't yet have the 2.1 version of the Python client library in PyPy, uh, but you can download this directly from the, the CML server. Um, the other thing is we've added additional examples here. So we've had examples that were already there, Plus, we've now added examples of how to use the licensing bits of the uh, Python client library. And um, not to toot my own horn, I, I, I contributed a, an example for how to do the link conditioning, which has also been incorporated into the Python client library. So those are the API uh, enhancements. There have been, I should say, a slew of, of bugs that were squashed in 2.1, both in the back end and in the front end, uh, bugs that were fixed in the API and the Python client library as well, um, performance enhancements, stability enhancements, and the team is continuing to work um, on, on further shoring up, stabilizing things, uh, heading in towards the, uh, the 2.1 general availability release. There will also be additional licensing uh, license types that will be available in 2.1 that aren't in the EFT. Uh, we're adding licensing types for uh, higher education or educational use cases in general. Um, and there will be a 40 node uh, personal license as well. So today, uh, CML personal is 20. There will be an additional license uh, that one can get that will allow up to 40 nodes for CML personal. Those are the, the major changes. Those are the major enhancements that you can expect in CML 2.1. Uh, if you're using the EFT, I encourage you to keep doing so and, and give us that feedback uh, so that we can make the 2.1 release um, as awesome as it can be. Uh, thanks again for watching, and uh, I look forward to sharing another video with everyone soon. Thanks.